So Carolyn touched on, on a lot of um, topics with cognition, and it shows really where OT and PT, uh, adult brain, OT and speech especially work so closely together in a team approach. Um, so I'm going to touch on some different areas of cognition as well. Um, and again, showing the magnitude of fatigue and cognition. So yesterday I was up for my 23 hours and I come to the airport and um, you know go through customs and their lovely custom agents. But I get to the one line and the gentleman's like, where are you, where are you going? And I'm like, I don't know. I turn to Tina and I'm like, where are we staying? I'm like, oh, that didn't look sketchy at all. So he's like, okay, you can go in that line. <laughs> Get to the next gentleman, again, lovely, beyond comprehension, because um, that's not New York and New Jersey where I'm from. And he's asking me questions, and he's like, where are you coming from? I'm like, New Jersey, New York, New Jersey. Finally, I looked at him. I'm like, I have been up for 23 hours. He's like, just go. <laughs> he was so nice. So cognitive impairment, there's a legitimate component of cognitive impairment, but fatigue is a huge component of um, cognitive issues as well. So it's just something to keep in mind as professionals. So cognitive impairment can be detected in, in a good portion of the population at the time of first diagnosis. So it's something like most people don't really think of that. They think it's like, oh, the person's diagnosed with MS. They have, you know, they're going along with their life and they've had MS maybe 10, 15 years and then whoa, whoa, now cognition is starting to come into play. No, there's a lot of people that Cognition has not only been one of their pr predicting factors, um, and it's been there all along when you actually go back and look at it. Um, and it's, it's, for some people, it's quite impactful at the time that they're, they're first diagnosed. One of the questions I always ask when I'm first meeting uh, someone for the first time, obviously, with um, MS is, when were you diagnosed? Everybody knows that date, like, straight off the bat. It was March 24th, 19... 19 um, 99, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, people really know that detail. But then I'll always ask them, were you having symptoms a long time before that? Because most oftentimes they're like, yeah, I was, I found myself like a few years before that I was tripping and falling. Rarely will they say that they were having cognitive issues, but when you start talking about some different things, they'll be like, oh yeah, I was, you know, this is something that I've been dealing with for quite some time, or my significant other always tells me I never remember that we're, you know, we're, what we're doing and what, what my appointments are. And there's a good portion of people that were going to de demonstrate cognitive dysfunction at some point during their illness. So some people have it in the beginning and some people will be those people 10, 15 years in, they start developing cognitive dysfunction. Because of that, it's something to keep in mind is that they're, one of the areas that they're really going to struggle with is decreased job performance and the social skills. Carolyn really talked about the importance of the social skills in not only swallowing difficulties with regards to that, but you take swallowing difficulties, add in cognitive difficulties, and that's going to make a big difference in someone's quality of life. So one of the other things that a lot of professionals I think rehab professionals are pretty good, and nursing is pretty good at detecting this, but um, depending on how much time you get to spend with someone, there can be someone with severe cognitive impairment, and they are just walking down the street like it's nobody's business. So people are like, oh, they have mild MS, whatever that winds up being. But, they, you know, because they're not walking with an assistive device, or they don't have a lot of spasticity. Um, but the cognitive impairment really can impact somebody's quality of life far more than someone's physical um, impairments can, can bother them. So understanding that the deficits can be present at, before, or after the time of diagnosis is important. Some of the deficits worsen um, the cognitive deficit. So if someone's fatigued like I am, you can hear them stutter all the time like I'm doing currently. But someone's stressed, if someone's really stressed, if they're having vision problems, if someone's having some visual, visual difficulties, they're not going to be able to retain information that's either written or on the TV or even having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone might be challenging because not being able to visualize their um, facial expression can really have an impact on trying to understand those subtle parts of communication such as body language. If someone's in a lot of pain, 
their cognitive cognition goes out the window if you're if you're speaking with someone and they're sitting you sitting in a wheelchair but the wheelchair is not quite positioned properly and there's a part that's constantly pressing on their side or you're speaking with someone that has really significant spasticity in their lower extremities and it's constantly like barking at them there's a good portion of that brain that's listening to that barking that's going on in their leg they're not able to use that cognitive portion of their brain to focus on the conversation. So there's all different things that will impact someone's cognition. Someone with age associated or more like Alzheimer's cognitive changes, it tends to be more global and it really like can affect someone's global cognition. In MS there's different areas to pick and choose. And Carolyn really touched upon a lot of those, so I'm not going to go too far into it, but processing speed is one of the hugest areas. So someone with the, the slower processing speed, it really transfers across all aspects of their life. As Carolyn like, really demonstrated quite well, so, so you, can, you can name um, pets as animals and then it takes a longer time to transition to kind of figuring out zoo animals. But when you add it into everyday life and trying to figure out, I just dropped my keys down an elevator shaft. <laughs> what are the things that I can do to, to rectify this? We all had great days yesterday, apparently. Um, it's something that really becomes impactful. And if you're repeating that over and over again throughout your life, it really takes a toll on how you're, you're dealing not only with your self-esteem, your ability to function with your family, but also your ability to function with your employer and other people in your life. So those are the things that you need to keep in mind. So characteristics of cognitive dysfunction. It doesn't correlate with physical disability. You can have an individual that is physically incapable of really, their bodies quite fail them. Their spasticity is significant, they have um, a lot of weakness, their fatigue, but they are as sharp as a tack. And you can have someone that's walking down the street like it's nobody's business, they don't look like they have any impact from their MS, but their cogni cognitive changes have really impacted their ability to function in everyday life and their roles within as a parent, as a partner, and as an employee are significantly impacted. Sometimes though, it's and usually not, there's only 10% of the people with MS with cognitive problems it, where it's severe. More often times it's subtle. So someone might not even be aware of the difficulty that they're having, they just know something doesn't fit right or it's just not working the right way or they think I'm starting to go crazy because they can't remember something or they have this tip of the word. One lady told me um, it, she felt like her, her internal internet was not functioning properly and she was constantly like recycling. So you know it's, it's just one of the ways that like I, I love the way that people will describe things because they come up with the best descriptions because they're living with it. And when it's that subtle difficulty it's very hard to pinpoint but it really is impactful especially on um, someone's intimate relationships with a partner or their children because it's just a perpetual back and forth but neither one can pinpoint what's not quite right. So it really does um, someone a great service to actually focus on this as professionals so that we can try to come up with areas to help them. Um, so obviously like I just was saying it's often under recognized and it's just that they can't or it's denied because I have to tell you myself, if that, that would be one of the scarier symptoms to me is the thought of I'm starting to lose my cognitive functioning because there's, it just affects every realm of your life. So it really is often denied because you know if we don't talk about it, it doesn't happen. Um, and that just makes it where it's more and more difficult to help someone with these, these issues. Um, and like I had said earlier too, it's not a global issue. It's usually more pinpointed either like long term, sometimes it's like long, not, not long term, um, the processing speed or the executive functioning, those higher level co cognitive issues. But this might turn into where someone might have difficulty with their ADLs, especially doing something like if you take doing their monthly bills, trying to keep track of their money. Um, it's, mul it's usually a multi-step task. They're trying to keep track of a lot of different things, juggling a lot of different balls, and it's an area that often comes up that's difficult. Um, and it's probably one of the higher reasons that people are under underemployed or unemployed is because of um, there's that lack of understanding and sometimes that lack of acceptance that you're having the cognitive difficulties. 
so risk factors in MS with, for people, um, early age of onset. So if someone's 15 when they're diagnosed with their MS, they're going to have a longer period of time that they're dealing with symptoms and the um, inflammatory aspects of the disease. They're going to have more changes to their brain and that's going to correlate to possibly more cognitive changes. Um, a secondary progressive course shows higher levels of cognitive changes. Someone with a lower than average or an inferior intelligence, it sounds awful, but they're going to have more of a cognitive difficulties that are more apparent because they don't have what's called like a brain reserve. So someone with a higher um, education level or a high, not, and not necessarily education, but a higher intelligence level has a little bit more backup to, to fall back on so that the, they can kind of automatically and naturally make some of those adjustments and those compensatory techniques on their own. Someone with a lower level, they just tend to not have that ability. Um, and this one always brings up a lot of things, but inhaled cannabis has been shown to have a lower, um, a, an effect on someone's cognition over a longer period of time. So commonly affected, um, Carolyn went into this, so I'm gonna go just go through it really quickly. Processing speed is a big area. Um, and when someone has a decreased processing speed, it's gonna affect other cognitive domains. So you're not processing quickly, you're gonna, it's also gonna affect your, your memory. It's gonna affect your um, problem solving. It's gonna affect your word finding and speech. Um, episodic memory, attention span, but not basic attention span. So that basic like one-to-one -one activity attention span's okay. It's more of that multitasking. That's really gonna be affected by someone um, with um, long-term, um, with cognitive deficits, and that encoding things into long-term memory. So you can talk to someone and they will tell you everything there is to know about their past a lot of times, but encoding something so that it remains in their memory bank is sometimes effective. Not that commonly affected, procedural learning. General intelligence. So you can have a conversation with someone and it'll be an absolutely lovely conversation and you will think there's nothing wrong with the person until you start to dig a little bit. And then all of a sudden some of these deficits come out. Um, like I said, basic attention. And then semantic memory is usually not commonly affected. Because these areas are not commonly affected, the mini mental status exam that a lot of people will use in, for a quick screen is useless. It's, a, it's, not, it's been shown um, to be non-effective for individuals with MS. Other areas from cognition, and again, it's been discussed, social emotional. It's a huge piece for someone. If they're not feeling um, quite there with their cognition to be able to just say, I'm gonna go out to dinner with my friends and engage in these conversations, do nacho night, you know, because it's easier to just be like, I'm just gonna stay home because their self-confidence is really kind of chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. If you're in a group and then your, your processing speed is slow, you're not gonna follow the shifts in conversation or the multiple conversations that are going on. Um, so and this really can impact family life because then all of a sudden you don't want to go out to dinner. You don't want to go to your husband's um, Christmas party or whatever it may be because you feel embarrassed that you're not going to be able to keep up or that you're going to seem like you're, you don't know what's going on. Because of that, it impacts your personal relationships. Um, and it can get to the point where there's difficulty with daily activities. Going through like a morning routine, it just might slow down and it might really impact how you're able to follow through. And another piece of it is, um, and it's like that executive functioning is almost trying to come up with the plan. It's like, I know I have to do my, my daily bills, but I don't even like kind of know where to begin you know, to get all the information together, to get the checkbook together, or to do the online banking, any of the things that come together. So it, it, can, it can become more and more difficult. Because of the, all of these areas, vocational and academic, as Carolyn talked about, so I'm not gonna go into that again. And then financial changes. Cognition can really impact someone's financial functioning because, because they're not working, they're un, under or unemployed. They're, they lose the income of their own, and then sometimes it gets to the point where someone may need so much caregiving that their caregiver can't quite work to the capacity that they need to. So it's another area that's significantly um, kind of tearing at interpersonal relationships. 
So these are some of the domains that we talked about. Memory, pr information processing, problem solving, visual, spatial. The, the attention concentration, like I had said, is not that one-to-one -one basic attention. It's that complex. So that's where the, the, the idea of the Thanksgiving dinner table might be overwhelming. But you talk to them about having like a one-to-one -one conversation, being able to have some meaningful interactions. So one of the tests that we, or screens that we use, is the symbol digit modality test. It's a fairly easy test to give. It can be given both where the person writes the answers and also where they can, they can do it verbally. Um, it's a quick screen. It only takes about five seconds. One of the cons that I'll talk about is that it um, can be a little bit expensive because it's, I think it's $60 for the booklet and then it's $50 for the test pages, um, but it is a good quick down and dirty screen. It's not going to tell you about functioning, but it's a good place to start so that it gives you an idea so that you can then delve into those conversations I talked about earlier that are really important. Um, whoops, I thought I had a picture of it. What it basically is, is um, there's a bar of symbols up above, there's numbers underneath those symbols that correlate with each one, and then the individual has to then match the symbols to the numbers in the, in the spots down below. Um, it's fairly easy and there's a, a MS functional composite where they do the 25 time foot walk, the nine hole peg test, and right now they're doing the pace up, but they might be changing it to this exam. So it's just, it's something to be aware of. It's very common in a lot of the MS literature that's used and it's a good quick screen. The PACESAT is the one that's currently in the MS Functional Composite. Does anybody use the PACESAT? Let's show of hands. Has anybody ever given this? Good, because you have an entire room of people that don't have people with MS that don't like you. This is kind of, it's a rough test. Most people will come to me like, they've been to the neuropsychologist, the neuropsychologist gives them this test, and they come in and they're like, I had the worst experience. <laughs> I felt like a dunce. It's not an easy test. The person's listening to a series of numbers and they have to add each consecutive number. So, um, oh, I don't have that screen. Um, it'll, it, it'll have a test, the way that it says is it's on a three second delay. So there's just numbers being written. So it'll say two, three, the person says five. Then it says seven, the person's supposed to say 10. So they're not adding the last number they said. They're constantly listening to the what's being said to them and adding. So it, it can get very challenging. There's a three second and a two second version. That's why they're trying to get away from it for the functional composite. But there still are areas where it's very good to do and it really takes a look at sustained attention. I tend to use the MOCA a lot. Um, it, it just is a good down and dirty screening of a lot of different areas. And it just, it's a screen again, it's not an assessment. Um, but in, in my practice in OT, I'm looking at cognition, vision, upper extremity function, fine motor kernel, like so many different areas that this works for me and then we can work from there, the areas that they're having difficulty or speak to the neuropsychologist if he's available. Um, so it's, it's a very good down and dirty screen. The other thing I like is number one, it's free. You can get it online. Um, there's versions in multiple languages. The, the English version comes in three different forms so that you can like kind of alleviate some testing bias on it. The ones that are in the other language I believe are only available in one form right now. I've, I've never used those ones so I, I'm not sure about that. But I do know that there's multiple languages. And again, it's free online so that's helpful. Um, so treatment for cognition. This is something where I work really closely with my speech um, therapists because we'll take a look at the different realms of cognition and try to, to help. But my areas in OT, I tend to try to do some more compensatory things. So I'm really working on trying to help them use assistive technology, trying to really work on something like working with calendars, whether it's on their phone, if the, so many people trying to rip away their paper from them is like horrifying. Other people want everything done online. 
If you can get someone to do like calendars online, it's great because you can set up different calendars with like just a calendar for them and their spouse. So it comes in in one color and then a calendar for the kids and it's another color so that they can keep a track in all one area, but they can also keep track of who this is important for them with. Um, so it's just another way of trying to touch base. Um, restorative treatment, I tend to have my speech partners work on a little bit more. <clears throat> um, because that's just, in, in my practice, that's where they're a little bit more um, experienced. And Carolyn went through a lot of this, so I'm not going to repeat it, because I want to get Sue some time to get up here to talk. Um, but also from the cognition standpoint, make sure you're including those discussions about sleep. You're talking about nutrition, someone not, not getting the right intake of water and fluid, they're dehydrated, their cognition's not gonna work the best it can. And working on different stress management is another way to effective, effectively change some cognitive difficulties. So there's a couple of different ideas on here you guys can look through. Um, but it, it, easy going compensatory techniques, again, te technology, scheduling, allowing a little bit longer time to complete tasks, decreasing distractions that are going on around someone. So if someone's trying to work on, I keep going to monthly bills, but they're trying to do their monthly bills and they're doing it in the middle of the kitchen and someone's cooking dinner and their one child is across the table from them doing homework and there's music in the background and a TV on in another room, they're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to focus as much as if you can go into a quiet room and really focus on that. Um, breaking things down into chunks so that it's not overwhelming. I know myself I need to do this, so if I look at something and it's this huge task, it's absolutely daunting, but if I go, okay, what needs to be done first and break it down, and teaching someone to use that kind of strategy can really help. Doing one thing at a time. Multitasking is not the most, it's not the most efficient for anybody they found across the board, but really for someone with MS, there's a lot of difficulty been shown in this, and make lists and check them off. There's nothing more satisfying than to have this big to-do list and to just go when you've done something. So keep that in mind um, to help people and listen to what they're saying. If someone's telling you, this is not gonna work for me, kind of talk to about them why, because some of it might be, oh my gosh, I've never used a calendar on my computer before, I, I just can't do it try it with them, but if they're still saying they can't, they're not gonna do it, they're not gonna use it. So then that's a strategy that's just gone out the window. One of the things, so, so there's managing the cognitive impairment from the non-pharmacological treatment. So that's kind of the stuff that we do in rehab. Making sure you're including family members, Carolyn talked about that also, the importance of that. So there's buy-in across the board for everybody. You can suggest counseling or psychotherapy. Um, and then, I don't know why, P PTOT, I thought speech was on there as well, obviously, for safety strategies and some environmental modifications. Pharmacologically, there's really no proven um, medicine that says this is gonna help with, with your cognition. Um, we have the disease-modifying therapies that are slowing the disease, hopefully also slowing the cognitive changes. Um, but the medications that have been around to slow cognitive dysfunction have really not been shown to be too effective for MS. Um, the other piece of it, I missed on one of the slides. I, don't, I went past that. Because of this and the processing and put, encoding that information in the long-term memory, when we are giving someone education, home exercise program, we're giving them all the kinds of disease, just information. Remember they're only gonna, people in general only t absorb about 30% of what a medical professional is telling them. So written handouts and spaced learning. So they come in one day and you review something, review it again two or three more times. You're gonna have a little bit more comprehension and follow through. But if you're thinking about like, especially like the nurses in the room, when you're going over how to use a medication, how to inject, how to like, there's only so much that they're gonna f encode and remember. You need to take that into account on what they're gonna absorb and what's gonna be falling through. So don't be afraid to ask, or in, in rehab, don't be afraid to ask them like, how's it going with your exercise program? Can you show me what you're doing? And they're like, so either they're not doing it because of the fatigue or 
they didn't understand what you were saying. So it's like, let's go through that again. Like, maybe this is, you know, I think this, like, one or two things is a really good place to start. Let's start with these one or two things and then build on it and repeat. So it's just another area that's really important. I'm going to let Sue come up. I know Dr. DeLuke has done a lot of work at the Kessler Institute in New Jersey. There's kind of proof, there's not really a lot of proof that, that that's been working. And he's been trying to tease through whether it's, that it's truly not working or they haven't been able to capture it. So that's like where he is kind of right now in a lot of the work. So it's kind of hard, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking, it's kind of hard to definitively say that there's some hard evidence that that retraining can come into play. So those things like a lot of people do like the luminosity and those other areas, they're not 100% sure, but it's one of those, it doesn't hurt either. So we kind of give that a try. Is patient self-report or family report that they feel as if the individual is I t information better? For a lot of that, I tend to use, there's, um, Dr. Benedict and Dr. Foley came up with the MSNQ. It's, um, it's an assessment that takes a look at f 10 different domain, like 10 different quick questions, and it asks the patient to fill out their answer on it, and it's like no difficulties at all until it's severely impacting my, my life. And they ask the same questions of a partner to see what's going on. And so the core, when, when you score it, and I just can't remember off the top of my head the way the scoring goes, one way is if, if the patient is scoring very high, it can be either that they're experiencing depression or cognitive changes. If the um, caregiver is putting a high score, sometimes it, it usually tends to be more cognitive changes. I use that tool not so much the way the, like just to, to point that out, to tease out the depression or the cognition, but it's a great discussion point. Because if like Lacey and I are, are doing the test and I'm the person with MS and Lacey's like my caregiver, I might fill out that I'm, this is very difficult for me to do, but Lacey might be saying, no, she has no problem with that. And that might either show that I'm having a lot of difficulty and I'm working really hard to hide it from her, so it's not recognized by my partner, or, the other way is is that I'm so just confused as to numbers. But there, that, that you say it's really that easy I say and I'm, I'm like, like oh, she it's can't do that fine. At all. I have no problem remembering appointments. Thank you. <laughs> and she's like, oh my god, this, <laughs> this is terrible. And it, and it shows that like there's like that cognitive uh, that you're not recognizing that you're having difficulty. The importance of that though is the discussion that follows. So you don't just like throw this bomb at them. It's the discussion and be like. You know, this is what's going on, and th and that really helps with the partnership and that um, trying to make sure that people are on the same page with each other. Because you know, I have to tell you that Turn for her. I took a chemo break to be able to come here, so I skipped my last chemo um, dose. Well, I got added on to the end. I skipped it, but my short-term memory has been horrendous, <laughs> just horrendous. Chemo brain is real. Yeah. And it's and it's so embarrassing that you don't have basic short-term recall. Like, did I walk the dog or did I not walk the dog? And he'll let me know, of course, if I didn't walk him because I'm heading out the door and he's following me. But right. short-term memory can be so stressful. And then the more you're stressed because you can't remember and it's embarrassing because somebody asks you a simple question and I'm like, I have no idea. And you, it just right. adds then to the anxiety, which then makes it harder for your brain to process right. information. A lot of it's all cycle too. And, and you take something to that effect. The dog's going to remind you you didn't take him out, but nobody's going to remind you you didn't take your medicine. So it's like coming up with different strategies. And it depends on the person. You might have a timer, or like I had a friend that would take his medicine, and once he took it, he would turn it over. And at the end of the day, he would look and see, make sure all of his medicines were upside down. And if they weren't, like, then he really had to, did I 
not put it down the right, but like you really got into the habit of like going from here to here, and that was the method that worked for him. I would have never thought of that. I'm like, genius, that works. I do that. And I've given it to like t 10 other of my, my people that I work with. So it's also sharing the ideas with everybody else. So. But at this point, we don't have any hardcore evidence that there's reorganization within the brain to assist with cognitive. Not functions. from the cognitive remediation standpoint. So it's hard. But. Wait, hang on a second. Let's give you this. <laughs> it's hard in this room. I was going to say, just from an anecdotal standpoint, people who come into our clinic who are doing things like luminosity um, fee have more confidence because they yes. feel they're being proactive and that they're um, doing things under their own steam and taking right. charge. And so even if it's not showing by research that it's helping, I think it is. It's it, like they're like brain, brain games that you play on different electronic devices. Yeah. I will also say that the uh, I've been doing a lot of research on mindfulness and just doing uh, mindfulness 10, 10 minutes a day uh, actually does improve the neuron density in the hippocampus and the frontal lobe, which are important in memory, personality, and um, higher cognitive function. So just giving your patients even, hey, maybe you should breathe for 10 minutes would be nice. Can I, can I ask a question just around judgment? Because I know judgment comes up and insight comes up a lot um, in our practice when uh, working in the community and um, there's not, it's, it's hard to find scales that will uh, objectify that, you know, and, and of course the, we come from a perspective of want to keep people as functional as possible and even shifting from one device, for example, an assisted device to the next device that's a lot more, that makes them appear more disabled. but. Um, that can be a problem on giving up driving and you know those safety concerns. What are you using to identify those? I, just clinical judgment. I think okay. it's real, like I don't give any assessment that's saying this person's not using their judgment. The other piece of it is again going back to the importance of sorry. The importance of the conversation to have with someone because you can introduce any kind of adaptive device or mobility device, and if the person that is expected to use it is not buying into this at all, it's just going to be a big dust collector in their house, yeah. no matter how helpful or how much you've shown to prove it. I think another aspect, too, is, like I know Lacey and, and Sue show a lot of video, that if you can show the individual the change that this device might cause, you're using another sense to kind of get them to to yeah. buy in. Yeah, for sure. I, th I know that uh, it, once they make the shift, it's good. It's just getting people to the, make that shift. Correct. I, I, I'm like, why? Why didn't I go to that power chair five years ago? And I hear that a lot because mm -hmm. it's given me so much freedom, but then <laughs> because okay. you didn't want it. <laughs> right, right. One of the things, too, is that the earlier the introduction to rehab in someone's mm -hmm. disease process, I believe, gets them to trust and understand the rehab professionals more. If you're throwing rehab at someone after the catastrophe has happened or after the difficulty has started, they're going to see us as people that they don't want to see because we're always, they always come to us with something that's broken as opposed to being proactive in the, that whole wellness approach. So that really applies to our people also. Any okay. other comments now on this cognitive piece? Anything else people want to share? Because I think this is an area that, you know, we're not always aware of and how it impacts the individual's life and daily routine and interactions with their family as well as, you know, friends within the community it may limit their socialization, may limit their ability to continue to work full time. And it really has a huge impact that we're not always sensitive to. It's very silent because most people don't want to admit it, you know, and most family members are afraid to bring it up because they don't want their, their person that they love mad at them because now they're talking about them and saying that they can't do things. It's scary. It's a scary symptom. I'll be back. For all right. I think oh, we'll... One other point. One other all right. Point. <laughs> Do you guys ever do functional cognitive assessments, like the multiple errands test or things like that? I just don't where I practice because okay. it's just... Oh, 
draw. Sorry. I just don't where I practice because it's just difficult to incorporate it into and then with with our whole insurance issue and so like I usually get limited visits and I'm covering 900 areas so I I can't like stress the the amount that I use I get the the outcome measures and the numbers that I need just for the insurance coverage and just so that you can track and then I use my conversations it's the biggest area that I 